introduce the next uh, speaker to all of you. That is uh, Mr. Tim Morse. Mr. Tim is a senior lecturer, emergency care, Department of Nursing, Midwifery and Healthcare Practice at Coventry University. Mr. Morse entered education after a clinical career in general medicine, general surgery, but uh, specializing in emergency nursing. He now teaches all aspects of emergency care to nurses from the, those undertaking pre-registration studies to those at master's level. Tim is also a course director to the BSc Free Hospital Emergency Care degree, which has many paramedic, paramedics on the course. The main emphasis of teaching is around patient health assessment, managing minor injury and illness, and pharmacology. He is currently on the trauma committee for the Emergency Nurse Association, USA. He has recently spoken at an international nursing conference in China and published papers relating to aspects of emergency care. Tim continues to support student nurses as a personal tutor and works closely with students developing dissertations. I kindly invite Mr. Tim Most to do his presentation on the topic, Critical Considerations in Managing Pediatric Trauma. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon everybody and uh, I'd like to thank the IAHS for inviting me to speak uh, this afternoon. I'm um, going to have a look at some of the considerations that we might need to think about when uh, dealing with children and I'm also going to sort of raise uh, some issues that have been um, perhaps a problem that we haven't necessarily dealt with particularly well within the United Kingdom. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just um, touch on the epidemiology and uh, just talk about trauma teams. Uh, we've mentioned those this mo um, today already, uh, but uh, particularly in relating to children. And then we're going to, I'm just going to talk about the assessment of children and then just think some about the issues around the management of some of the problems. So, in terms of epidemiology, children represent roughly 25% of the population within the UK. Now, of those, um, in terms of uh, those involved in trauma, so they're the children involved in trauma, 30% of them are considered to be involved in major trauma. Now, we um, have already discussed that trauma is actually the most common cause for morbidity and mortality, certainly in the US children, and um, this is a typical and same story for those within the UK as well. What we've got to do, though, is just recognise some of the, you know, the unique needs of children and um, sort of uh, have a look at how they may differ anatomically to understand how to manage them better. We also know, um, as we've discussed with adults, that trauma is the leading cause of death in children older than one year old, and the average age is about 10 years old. And again, this is a typical story both in America and in the UK. In terms of burns, burns are most prevalent in those aged one to four. I guess being uh, toddler and exploring. Upper limb injuries, are well, they're more common in those aged five to nine. And lower limb and head injuries, more prevalent in adolescents, I guess is their participation in sports and probably other more daring feats. Now the most trauma is caused by blunt injury. Only about 20% is penetrating trauma and unfortunately, uh, we are having or are seeing a growth in uh, wounding from stabbing in teenagers, particularly. 
There was a paper published by the NHS Clinical Advisory Group, National Health Service Advisory Group, in 2011, relating to the management of trauma um, of children, um, particularly those in, involved in major trauma. One of the main things that came out of that was the fact that there's the recognition that they were either under or over triaged due to their physiological differences. The other thing that is uh, quite apparent is that whilst we have a population within the UK of about 25, perhaps 30% uh, children, the paramedics only spent between 5 to 10% of their education on paediatric teaching. So it's quite clear that our UK paramedics needed and we do need more paediatric teaching. Now the other problem is because of the, those involved in major trauma and being transferred to a paediatric level one trauma centre, the times in terms of distance um, are greater. And so there is a delay in uh, transferring our children. So that is something that is being addressed. Now, the other thing we have to think about is the physiological parameters of children in terms of how we monitor them and how careful we watch them. And clearly, we need to understand that they are very different to those of adults. We hear very often that, oh, our children, are well, raising the question, are children just young adults? Indeed, no. The other important thing with children and certainly this was highlighted in this paper, is the treatment of pain. Uh, just from my experience, there is an issue around uh, medical staff perhaps under-prescribing analgesia to control children's pain. So that needs also to be looked at. So when we're responding then to somebody who's involved in uh, trauma as a child, Who's in the team? Who's involved? Well, the, um, you know, we know that trauma is complex, so by the mere fact of it being complex, then we do need a multidisciplinary response, so our team's going to be complex too. And um, certainly in the UK, most hospitals do have very clear guidelines uh, as to how we actually manage uh, children made of trauma. So there are, there are sort of documents written out to make it quite clear who is doing what and how do people respond and how are um, sort of things escalated. Al although we accept that major trauma for children doesn't really happen that often because of uh, safety measures, etc., there are um, good outcomes as a result of using these protocols and it does lead actually to quite good decision making and there is a drive to make sure that there are um, good lines of communication. And so the success, really, to managing trauma, particularly in children, is having a good team. But I also think it's about controlling that team as well. Because I recall some 15, 20 years ago, uh, calling for, uh, I was an 18-month-old uh, little boy was involved with in trauma and I uh, was working in the emergency department at the time and required assistance. I had a full adult nursing team and medical team, but we also had a paediatric medical team and a paediatric nursing team. We had 15 people around a little individual who was probably no longer than two feet in length. Or 60 centimetres. So, as a result of that, we, got, we clearly got rid of a lot of the team members because we didn't need them. And so, protocols like this does mean now that we do have prescribed roles for the team, so anybody else that we don't need can leave. And so, uh, this is an example of a um, team that is written out within Birmingham Children's Hospital as a dedicated children's hospital and the team that they have. And this is just lifted straight from their protocol and they identify a number of people within the team 
uh, starting with the team leader. And there are a number of um, roles within there, and they all have a specific job description. And so uh, Nurse 1 and Nurse 2, for example, have very clear roles as to what they're expected to do or not to do. And so there's no overlap of role. One of the things we don't want to happen is that um, everybody seems busy doing their role and somebody's forgetting something. And so that would indeed be the role of the team leader. One of the things that works very well, and certainly it's been already mentioned uh, today from Renee regarding the trauma nursing core course of protocols, is the, the handover. The Birmingham Children Handover, though, does differ because it adds two more elements to that, age and time. So we, have, they, we do need to know the age of the child and a little bit about demographics, etc., and the time of the expected time of arrival and, indeed, uh, the time of the incident so we can interpret delay. But then we follow the traditional MIST a mnemonic of mechanism of injury, injury sustained, and also the signs in, um, in terms of the temperature, pulse, respiratory rate, and blood pressure on the scene, and any other findings, and then what treatment's been delivered prior to the arrival of the individual and the child. So this is a specific handover to make sure nothing's missed or forgotten um, in the rush sometimes to try and deal with this child. So what, do we go, what are we going to do then with the initial assessment? Well, we follow quite strict protocols, but also we to think about the milestones that the child has achieved in terms of their age. We also need to think about mechanism of injury. I do recall a five-year-old child that I had to deal with this little child was a, suffered with cerebral palsy and had significant learning difficulties and the child was fixed to a child seat. Unfortunately, the metal framed child seat wasn't fixed to the car. So, of course, in terms of mechanisms of injury, as unfortunately grandma who was driving lost control and hit the side of a bridge the child seat with the metal frame and child projected through the windscreen of the vehicle. It's very difficult trying to explain to a five-year-old who already has extreme learning difficulties as to why their face hurt so much because that was unfortunately a bit that broke the glass. So head injury uh, in children is the most common uh, cause of injury and it sadly causes most disability too. So we use a standard assessment and this is a typical assessment across uh, the UK. It comes from the ATLS Strokes Trauma Nursing Core Course which is run by the Major Nurse Association in America and we all follow the same um, pathway and that is C in brackets is for catastrophic hemorrhage. Otherwise, it's A, little c, for cervical spine management, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I. And Renee has already covered that with us, so I won't dwell on that so much. But I will pick up on some of those as we go through. The other thing, though, for children, which is um, certainly within our ch uh, children's sort of trauma courses, is... The D, E, F, and G, which also stands for don't ever forget glucose. So it's really important in children that we also test the blood glucose. Now the one thing with children is that they do seem to have quite a good physiological reserve. One of the things we have to do, though, is maintain good cerebral perfusion because blood pressure they seem to be able to maintain very well. I think it's important and it's that glancing look across the room sometimes of just having a quick look at the child to um, see what you think. And 
certainly we know that uh, a child develops really from head downwards. So as a toddler, their head is much bigger than their body. And certainly their occiput stands proud. And so, as again has been discussed this morning, there's been, there's been an issue relating to airway management because the occiput, uh, need, the shoulders need lifting to put their neck into neutral alignment. The other thing, though, is that the lower limbs, the legs, seem to grow last. And it is those that grow later on in life, and um, we're talking sort of months over the toddler age group, and when they have growth spurts. That's important when we're thinking about having that quick look. The other thing we know is that the child seems to develop from the middle outwards. So, again, mentioning in terms of limbs, limbs will grow um, later, but they, their thorax and abdomen start to develop. Certainly their chest changes shape. And again, this is something just to consider it of. The other important thing, though, is that from a neurological perspective, their gross motor movements develop and they change. And they then move into the finer finger movements that they can pick up small pieces, for example. So, from a neurological perspective, they are again developing as their growth moves outwards. Having a quick look, first of all, we need to just think about their general appearance. Just have a look at their tone. Are they floppy or are they rigid? Are they interacting? If they don't want to play, don't want to know, don't want to look at you, then um, is it because there's something wrong? Are they inconsolable in terms of crying? Have they got an abnormal look or are they gazing? may not necessarily be normal. What about their cry or their speech? Is that different? And that's certainly something you can deem from the uh, parents or carers. What about breathing? When you're having a quick look, are they making grunting sounds or snoring sounds or stridal? What about their positioning in terms of chest breathing? Are they in a normal position? Have they got recession in their chest? And are they using their neck muscles and abdominal muscles to try and breathe? As their nasal obligate breathers, and in young children, are, do they have any nasal flaring? Are they gasping for breath? What about their colour? Are they mottled? Are they cyanos? Or are they just pale? So that quick look, we can only take five seconds actually can offer us a huge amount of information. Then we can move on to the primary assessment, and that's going to start off with looking at airway and C-spine protection, and being aware of the age of the child and managing that neck. And certainly, as I've just said, children, young children, are obligate nose breathers, so they will breathe through their nose in preference to breathing through their mouth. They've got quite a large tongue when they're Youngsters, their trachea is short, and their cricoid um, is a different shape, it's C-shaped. So as a result of that, um, being a toddler, they've got a big head, but it's heavy. So their neck may be lax, and certainly we see that in babies, and young babies, where you have to sport their head because the neck is so floppy. Mind you saying that, of course, they're probably less prone to neck injury because the bones necessarily haven't ossified as well as they will do. The other thing to think about though is we were always told you only use uncuffed tubes in those under the age of eight. But indeed, we can now start using uh, cuffed tubes because the tubes designed for um, children under the age of eight, very soft cuffs and are now under very low pressure, 
So there's no problem now to be concerned about inflaming the trachea or indeed affecting epiglottis. So what about breathing? Well, assessing breathing, we know children are diaphragmatic breathers. Small children have quite flat, quite flat chest, and the other problem with small children is they are more prone to diaphragmatic herniation. In other words, if they are positioned in a child's seat and the belt cuts across their abdomen, then it can force their abdomen, because they have weak, sort of quite weak abdominal muscles, can actually then force their abdominal contents up into their chest, and because their diaphragm is quite weak, could result in um, some form of herniation. So that's something to be thought about within your assessment. The other thing with the child is their mediastinum is very mobile, so it will move quite easily. And as I mentioned earlier, the ribs are quite thin and the ribs are normally flat in a young child, whereas an adult is more angled. So the shift in breathing excursion is much less than that of an adult. So it's a quite significant difference. So, <clears throat> when a child arrives and uh, is to be assessed, one of the ways we can do this is using something called a Braslow tape. This Braslow tape is uh, measured from the top of their head and the length of the child gives an indication the sorts of adjuncts in terms of size that we can use. It's quite a useful colour coding system in the, into um, sort of choosing what size tubes to use, nasogastric tubes, what drugs to give, what doses to give, and it is relatively weight uh, connected. Of course, the other way of doing this same approach is using some sort of rainbow mattress, and rainbow mattresses. Uh, again, use or offer a similar approach. However, there was some work done by Knight et al., and they've actually suggested, because of the differences in children between urban areas and rural areas, that actually they're not as good as they were first thought. They're only 50% accurate in um, sort of predicting weight. And of course, they, uh, in countries where there's lots of types of cultures, then they're even less so in predicting uh, the size of individuals. So they may not be as good as we first thought. <coughs> now talking about weight, uh, we've always used the traditional um, calculation for counting a child's weight, certainly for under the age of 10. Um, so uh, if we're called by an ambulance service to say we have a nine-year-old en route, we can start planning and start calculating weights. And the typical formula that we would use to calculate the weight in kilograms is this. However, the Advanced uh, Pediatric Life Support Group um, have revised the calculation for weight now, and this changed um, relatively recently. And so we use now the calculation if it's like 1 to 12 months or 1 to 5 or 6 to 12, we use now a different calculation. And this is much more accurate to take in variation in the different um, sizes of children. So again, something to be considerate of in terms of how children are varying now. Indeed. I read only so recently an 11-year-old child in terms of their body weight was greater than the average weight of an adult uh, because of issues, certainly in the UK, with childhood obesity. Well, what about circulation then? Well, one of the things with circulation is that we've got to try and recognise this child is bleeding or are they developing hypovolemia. Now the thing to think about really for young children is that they only have 80 mils of blood per kilogram of body weight within their circulation. So 
That's not a lot of blood if it's spilled. So the really the only way we're going to get any idea of developing hypervolemia is a tachycardia. Of course, we do have to think about what medication they're on as well, of course, but certainly tachycardia is the first thing we need to be thinking about. We need to think about capillary refill as well, and capillary refill of more than two seconds will indicate significant blood loss. We need to look at changes in a child's mental state and certainly encouraging family presence here in terms of uh, parents giving us some idea of is this normal. Losing of peripheral pulses is significant. So having a child who may be tachycardic but the vital signs are normal is concerning Then you should be um, sort of aware that something significant may be developing. The problem with children, of course, as I'm sure we're all aware, is that a child can um, accommodate and sort of adjust their physiological parameters quite well, and all of a sudden they collapse. So hypertension in a child and, uh, doesn't really occur until they've lost about 30% of their blood volume. That means significant significant ischemia. So that's a real problem and a real issue. So in terms of fluid replacement, we can give 20 mils per kilogram. This is the general guide across all um, training groups within the UK. Or if you're going to give blood, it's advised to give 10 mils per kilogram um, as bolus. The one thing you will need to be aware of, though, is children with congenital heart disease is that giving too much fluid might just tip them the other way. So listening to their chest for crackles for signs of heart failure um, would normally be unheard of, but certainly in children with congenital heart disease it's important just to make sure that they're not going the other way, that they can actually handle the fluid. In terms of disability in children, one of the things that we've got to keep an eye on is their mental state. They don't have huge glucose reserves, so their change in mental state could be because they have a low blood glucose. So if their mental state does change, we need to consider a couple of things. We do know that they have a very small subarachnoid space, and if they are bleeding from head injury, and because they have less CSF, in that space, this could be the developing problem. The other thing to consider is avoid hyperventilation um, in terms of oxygenation, because hyperventilation, and there's indeed a lot of debate about using oxygen trauma, um, could cause vasoconstriction. So actually, reduce um, cerebral perfusion more so. And then there's exposure in terms of um, stripping them off but keep them warm, but avoid hypothermia. One of the things we need to consider in um, children is the same um, problem that we have with adults, and that's something we call the lethal triad. Now, the lethal triad, <coughs> I will spend a few moments on, um, the other thing to think about children who may actually become clammy is that they have a greater surface area than volume ratio. So again, something to think about when children have that insensible loss through sweating. I think the other issue to consider, albeit sad, is to look also for signs of abuse. Because this trauma could actually be an non-accidental injury. Clearly, we need to address the child's pain adequately, um, something, for example, like morphine. I do know, just from my personal experience, that medical staff always are on the lower end of uh, analgesia 
because of the concern of giving too much. So what's this lethal triad about then? Well, the lethal triad, in circulatory terms, is to do with hypothermia, coagulopathies, and the, uh, developing acidosis. Once this triangle sets up as a spiral, this sp it spirals downwards and becomes more and more difficult to manage the child and trauma as it would do indeed with an adult. Now we know what the effects are with adults. What about children? And does this lethal triad actually apply to children? What happens? Well, we know in trauma that particularly for children, they have some tissue factor that that's released and the cells are damaged and those cells do release myoglobin their cell contents, which are all inflammatory factors. We also know if a child becomes hypovolemic, that they're going to release adrenaline and noradrenaline to try and control their blood pressure and heart rate. We also know, though, in case of hypothermia, that a child will have significant reduced platelet function in terms of clotting in trying to clot or indeed tamponade any bleeding. What about the issue with children then? Is it the same as adults? Well, having looked at a number of papers, this one's entitled Coagulopathy and Shock and Admission is associated with mortality in children and traumatic injuries, suggesting then that perhaps this lethal triad is significant in children. And it was work was done by the children, the civilians, affected in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, the findings were that certainly in shock, that was associated with morbidity in terms of a difference in their uh, bicarbonate and in terms of acidosis. We also know that their international normalized ratio in terms of clotting factor, um, the INR great was um, if it was greater than 1.5, that also contributed to child death. But interestingly, because uh, these are perhaps warmer countries, the hypothermia issue only related to 2.8% of all those children that were included in the study. So it does exist, but does hypothermia play a part? Brett et al., uh, wrote a paper on the impact of hypothermia in the rural areas um, in, in a pediatric trauma patient. And this is a US study looking at 1,629 uh, children in a uh, level one trauma center. So 182 patients were admitted with a temperature that was less than 36 degrees centigrade as a body temperature. And they found that hypothermia was actually associated with increased mortality. They also found, well they also found as a group, that bleeding was also more common in that hypothermic group, possibly because of the differences relating to platelets. Another paper here by Sundberg who looked at hypothermia and poor outcome. So I so thought I'd just pull out another one and just see if hypothermia does play a part. A smaller study, mind, but certainly um, they found that 12% um, of the patients that were involved in the study, they had a temperature of less than 35 degrees C, and they homed in on those patients particularly. They also found there's an increase in mortality in those that were hypothermic. And there was a trend actually between hypothermia and changes on head CT in terms of um, any potential brain injury. So there was a link between that child becoming hypothermic and not managing their own body temperature. So what about avoiding then this lethal triad? 
Well, we know that treatment for those involved in trauma does start in the pre-hospital phase. It can start in the pre-hospital phase. So one of the important things here, quite simply, is try to avoid hypothermia and indeed try and uh, prevent blood loss. So give crystalloids, and in the UK we've shifted away from using uh, colloids now. In the emergency department, um, offering blood, which is warm. But here's a challenge to somebody who's only got 80 mils per kilogram. What about permissive hypertension? Can we afford to let them run at a low blood pressure? Well, sadly, there aren't any studies to support its use. Not on children, because of the issues of ethics, I guess. It's quite difficult to implement, I guess, because of the variation of blood pressure according to age. As a child grows older, their blood pressure becomes more and more adult as a norm. It could, though, minimise blood loss. But it's contentious, isn't it? Do we let a child run at a low blood pressure? However, Morrison et al. study looking at um, hypertensive resuscitation and thinking about um, that very thing, permissive hypotension. What they found is that, <clears throat> well, they looked at a low mean arterial pressure versus a higher mean arterial pressure. Interestingly, though, those with a low mean arterial pressure actually received less blood products and they had better clotting they had um, the coagulopathy problems were less the low mean arterial pressure group had a lower 30 day mortality so survivability was greater so what about secondary assessment well we need to do a full set of vital signs and obviously we need to do uh, peripheral oxygen as well we need to think about tubes, nasogastric and catheter, if that's appropriate, of course. And also monitoring as well, heart monitoring and bloods. And any other information we can redeem as well, uh, handover, um, seeing the full history. And then we need to perform this uh, full head-to-toe examination to see if we're missing anything. So we do look for other injuries. Don't forget their back. I did look after a little girl who'd fallen on a, we call it a cold frame in the UK. It's where Grandad was uh, just hardening his plants off before he planted them out in the garden. And she slipped and fell backwards, and she looked, came in on her back, and looked absolutely fine. But what happened, we kept her in, thankfully, because overnight she had blood pressure fell, and she'd got actually a thin shard of glass which didn't show up on x ray had passed through her kidney and ruptured a kidney. And so, it's one of those, glad we kept her in. We only do one log roll. And that one log roll is because if there is any bleeding internally that's tamponading, we don't keep shaking the patient around and disrupting it. So we just roll them once. Potential injuries? Well, head injuries are most common. In children under two, Brain shaking seems the most common, um, certainly where parents may find crying difficult. It's illegal in Scotland, it is still legal in England. One of the problems with brain shaking is it causes retinal hemorrhage, or indeed subdural or subarachnoid hemorrhage, certainly very significant. In children over three, well, the most common thing is pedestrian accidents or motor vehicle collisions. In the UK, we call them MVCs. So, early CT uh, might mask any brain damage. Um, so, there's a consideration about doing CT later as well. And we're always careful using fluids. So, with head injuries, then, we know metabolic demand is high uh, in brain injuries, so we need to keep an eye on glucose and or even think about enteral feeding as well. 
because there's a big demand of, uh, metabolically, then oxygen goes up, so they need more oxygen. Mild head injuries, though, <coughs> those with a GCS, 14 to 15 out of 15, watch carefully, because these are the ones that may bleed slowly into a significant bleed. Neck injury, rare in children, will be guarded, because they don't always show up on x-ray. Other injuries, well, facial lacerations, just be careful. The facial nerve runs just in front of the ear, so uh, make sure that they can move their face properly. Chest trauma, well, do think about uh, it is actually the second leading cause of death, so things to um, watch, certainly chest shape and their breathing, but it is relatively uncommon in children. They've got a soft rib cage, very pliable. Vessel damage, it's rare, but again, be aware. Abdominal injury, well, they have an unprotected abdomen. And don't forget, the abdomen starts at the nipple line, fifth intercostal space. That's where the diaphragm, um, when they exhale, lifts up to. So, abdomen's large. It's not protected because they have thin abdominal muscles. So, their solid organs are vulnerable. Bruising can be significant. One of the things to think about in abdominal injury is that there's a 50% chance of also lumbar vertebral damage as well. So they may have a spinal problem, with abdominal problems, especially from seatbelt injuries. In terms of solid organs, manage them conservatively. Our home suggests that only 5% of patients actually need uh, intervention. So certainly in splenic injury, um, manage them conservatively and most of the time that can be done they just be sit on and watch well not literally sit on but you know what I mean in liver injury <clears throat> again 90% of the time can be managed conservatively but just make sure there's no damage to the vessels and also the kidneys need to be checked as well because they may be vulnerable in the young child so play a sit and watch game first 48 hours, perhaps. Obviously, in kidney injury, if they've got direct injury, then obviously we're looking for blood within the urine. Do think, though, about non-accidental injury. Have that in your mind. As I said, close head injury is the most common injury. There are a lot of parents who may actually mask the fact that they've injured their child or somebody else has. In fact, in terms of group of children, most children uh, that are abused are within the age of three. So just please, in children, be extra vigilant about assessing them. I'm going to introduce to you something that particularly Coventry isn't proud of. A little boy called Daniel Pelka, for whom you may have seen on the, in the, within the media. We didn't learn from the stories of Victoria Columbier in the 1980s. And Daniel Pelko was a little boy, aged four, at school. The teachers saw him. The teachers noticed he was losing weight. The social workers noticed he was losing weight. The hospitals noticed he was losing weight. But his mum gave good stories and it was all dismissed. Daniel Pelka died of starvation and um, his parents were both imprisoned but what happened here is that nobody coordinated the services within Coventry relating to the management of the child. In fact, this is just a number of cases that have occurred within the UK media, unfortunately, over the last 10 years. So just watch and if you have a hunch that there's something wrong go with your hunch so I've added a few references there for you as well and they'll be on the CD and thank you very much